My hope is that anyone who listens will be helped in reaching their goal in life. Is there a force, a factor, a power, a science, call it what you will, a something which a few people understand and use to overcome their difficulties and achieve outstanding success? I firmly believe that there is. I am presenting it in the language of a businessman who believes that sincere thinking and plain speaking will get any message across to the people. I realize I have run across something that is workable, but I don't consider it as anything mystical except in the sense that it is unknown to the majority of people and is little understood by the average person. I have read literally thousands of books on modern psychology, metaphysics, ancient magic, voodooism, yogism, theosophy, Christian science, unity, truth, new thought, and many other dealings. Many of these books were nonsensical, others strange, and many very profound. Gradually, I discovered that there is a golden thread that runs through all the teachings and makes them work for those who sincerely accept and apply them. That thread can be named in a single word, belief. It is the same element or factor, belief, which causes people to be cured through mental healing, enables others to climb the ladder of success and gets phenomenal results for all who accept it. Why belief is a miracle worker is something that cannot be satisfactorily explained, but have no doubt about it. There's genuine magic in believing. As a matter of fact, the idea that I could, with my thinking and believing, develop a fortune never entered my mind. It doesn't matter to what end this science is used, it will be effective in achieving the object of your desires. Glance around you. If you are in a furnished room, your eyes tell you that you are looking at a number of inanimate objects. Now that's true so far as visual perception is concerned, but in reality, you are actually looking at thoughts or ideas which have come into materialization through the creative work of some human being. It was a thought first that created the furniture, fashioned the window glass, and gave form to the draperies and coverings. The automobile, the skyscraper, the great planes that sweep the stratosphere, the sewing machine, the tiny pen, a thousand and one things, yes, millions of objects. Where did they come from originally? Only one source, from that strange force, thought. As we look further, we realize that these achievements, and in fact all our possessions, came as a result of creative thinking. Thought is the original source of all wealth all success, all material gain, all great discoveries, inventions, and of all achievements. With that in mind, it becomes easy to understand that a man's thoughts make or break him, and Shakespeare's words become more intelligible. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Many people feel that success comes with hard work. However, I would like to point out that hard work alone will not bring success. The world is filled with people who have worked hard but have little to show for it. Something more than hard work is necessary. It is creative thinking and firm belief in your ability to execute your ideas. The successful people in history have succeeded through their thinking. Their hands were merely helpers to their brains. Another important point is 
that one essential to success is that your desire be an all obsessing one your thoughts and aims be coordinated and your energy be concentrated and applied without let up it may be riches or fame or position or knowledge that you want for each person has his own idea of what success means to him but whatever you consider it to be you can have it provided you are willing to make the objective the burning desire of your life by using the dynamic force of believing you can set all your inner forces in motion they in turn will help you reach your goal the first thing to determine is precisely what you want starting in with the general idea that you merely want to be a success as most people do is too indefinite you must have a mental pattern clearly drawn in your mind ask yourself where am i headed what is my goal have i visualized just what i really want if success is to be measured in terms of wealth can you fix the amount in figures if in terms of achievement can you specify it definitely i ask these questions for in their answers are the factors which will determine your whole life from now on most people have a general idea that they would like to be a success but beyond that everything is vague you must know where you are headed and you must keep a fixed goal in your view only then will you get what you are after you begin with desire if you ever hope to achieve anything or gain more than you have now however as we shall see there is more to it than mere desire it has been said that thought attracts that upon which it is directed thought attracts that upon which it is directed our fearful thoughts are just as creative or just as magnetic in attracting troubles to us as are the constructive and positive ones in attracting positive results so no matter what the character of the thought it does create after its kind when this sinks in to a man's consciousness he gets some inkling of the awe inspiring power which is his to use I cling to the theory that while thoughts do create and exercise control far beyond any limits yet known to man they create only according to their pitch intensity emotional quality depth of feeling or vibratory plane in other words comparable to the wavelength and wattage of a radio station thoughts have a creative or controlling force in the exact ratio of their constancy intensity and power all persons living in high altitudes have felt and sometimes observed the electric spark resulting from walking across the room then touching some metallic substance that of course is a form of static electricity generated by friction it gives you an idea of how one kind of electricity can be developed through the body sigmund freud the famous austrian psychoanalyst brought the world's attention to the hypothesis that there was a powerful force within us an unilluminated part of the mind separate from the conscious mind constantly at work molding our thoughts feelings and actions others have called this division of our mental existence the soul some call it the superego the inner power the superconsciousness the unconscious the subconscious and various other names it isn't an organ or so-called physical matter such as we know the brain to be nevertheless it is there and from the beginning of recorded time man has known that it exists the ancients often referred to it as the spirit paracelsus called it the will others have called it the mind an adjunct to the brain some have referred to it as conscience the creator of the still small voice within still others called it intelligence and have asserted that it is a part of the supreme intelligence to which we are all linked 
No matter what we call it, I prefer the word subconscious, it is recognized as the essence of life, and the limits of its powers are unknown. It never sleeps, it comes to our support in times of great trouble, it warns us of impending danger, often it aids us in what seems impossible. It guides us in many ways and when properly employed performs so-called miracles. Perhaps the most effective method of bringing the subconscious into practical action is through the process of making mental pictures, using the imagination, perfecting an image of the thing or situation as you would have it exist in physical form. This is usually referred to as visualization. Before this visualization can work, you must really believe. A firm and positive conviction that goes through every fiber of your being. When you believe it heart and soul, as the saying goes. Now call it a phase of emotion, a spiritual force, a type of electrical vibration, anything you please. But that's the force that brings outstanding results. It sets the law of attraction into operation and enables sustained thought to correlate with its object. This belief changes the tempo of the mind or thought frequency and like a huge magnet draws the subconscious forces into play, changing your whole aura and affecting everything about you and often people and objects at great distances. Many times the solution of our problems result from the use of the conscious mind. But now and then, when the solution is not forthcoming, we become exhausted with continued trying. We begin to lose confidence in ourselves and we often resign ourselves to the idea that we have failed, that nothing can be done about it. Here is where the subconscious mind comes in. It helps us to renew our belief in ourselves. It assists us to overcome our difficulty and to put us on the road to achievement and success. Just as the conscious mind is the source of thought, so the subconscious is the source of power. Also, it is one of the greatest realities in human life. It is rooted in instinct and is aware of the most elemental desires of the individual, yet it is always pressing upward into conscious existence. It is a distinct entity. It possesses powers and functions with unique mental organization all its own. It maintains and preserves the well-being and indeed the very life of the body. Unaided by the conscious mind, in times of great emergency, it springs into immediate action, again independent of the conscious mind. It takes supreme command, acting with incredible certitude, rapidity, accuracy, and understanding in the saving of the life of the individual. It can be summoned to help the conscious mind in times of great personal necessity. When the conscious calls upon the subconscious to use its powers and resources to solve a vital problem or bring to pass that which is sought or desired by the individual. To draw upon the resources and powers of the subconscious and awaken it into action, you must first be sure that you are asking for something that is rightfully yours to have and is within your ability to handle. The subconscious manifests itself only according to the capabilities of the person. Then you must have patience and absolute faith. The subconscious mind will not take the trouble to work for those who do not believe in it. In conveying your need to the subconscious, it must be in the spirit that the work has already been done. So while it is necessary for you to feel and think yourself successful, it is important for you to go one step further and actually see yourself as already successful, either in the performance of some selected task or as actually occupying the position to which you are aspiring. For the next and final step, you must wait patiently while the subconscious is assimilating the elements of your problem 
and then goes about its own way to work it out for you. The solution of your problem will be revealed to you. The correct course of action will be indicated. You must follow those indications immediately and unquestioningly. There must be no hesitation on your part, no mental reservation, no deliberation. You must receive the message from the subconscious freely and after understanding it, you must act on it at once. Only by doing that will you make your subconscious serve you and continue to respond whenever you call upon it. One day you will find yourself in the position you sought through the aid of the subconscious and doing the work you envisioned for yourself. Then when you look back, you will see how the things you were called upon to do all formed a logical line of events. The last one of which was your final arriving, the reward of your sincerest hopes and desires, your own triumphant personal success. To become the person that you would like to be, you create a mental picture of your newly conceived self. And if you continue to hold it, the day will come when you are in reality that person. Shakespeare said, assume the virtue if you have it not. After studying the various mystical religions and different teachings and systems of mind stuff, one is impressed with the fact that they all have the same basic modus operandi, and that is through repetition. This brings us to the law of suggestion, through which all forces operating within its limits are capable of producing phenomenal results. It is the power of suggestion and auto-suggestion, your own to yourself, or hetero-suggestion coming to you from outside sources that starts the machinery into operation or causes the subconscious mind to begin its creative work. And right here is where the affirmations and repetitions play their part. It's the repetition of the same chant the same incantation, the same affirmations that lead to belief. And once that belief becomes a deep conviction, things begin to happen. In the Depression years, we saw this same suggestive force working overtime. Day after day, we heard the expression, times are hard, business is poor, the banks are failing, prosperity hasn't a chance, and wild stories about business failures on every hand until they became the national chant. Millions believed that prosperous days would never return. Hundreds, yes, thousands of strong-willed men went down under the constant hammering, the continuous tap-tapping of the same fear of vibratory thoughts. Money, always sensitive, runs to cover when fear suggestions begin to circulate, and business failures and unemployment follow quickly. We heard thousands of stories of bank failures, huge concerns going to the wall, and people believed them readily and acted accordingly. 
Success or failure in business is caused more by mental attitude rather than by mental capacities. Let's consider charms, talismans, amulets, good luck pieces, four-leaf clovers, old horseshoes, a rabbit's foot, and countless other trinkets which thousands of people believe in. By themselves, they are inanimate, harmless objects without power. But people breathe life into them by thinking they do have power, even though the power isn't in them per se. The power comes only with the believing, which alone makes them effective. In assuming the virtue, you are assuming via your imagination. But here we must make a distinction between daydreaming and a true mental picture or proper use of the imagination. When you employ your imagination properly, you see yourself doing a thing and you go ahead and do it. It's the doing the thing you have pictured to yourself that brings it into actual existence. In this connection, think about the use of the magnifying glass. When properly focused, it will gather the light from the sun and concentrate it so that the heat will burn a hole in the object on which the rays are focused. It must be held steady before the heat power is developed, and so it is with the holding of the image or the mental picture. However, it is very difficult for the average person to concentrate for any length of time, to say nothing of holding on to a mental picture for any great period. You are constantly being swayed by what you read and hear, and as a result, the coordinating part of this creative force turns to gathering together all these scattered elements in a focused mass, instead of devoting itself to making a clear and dynamic picture of your desire. Don't give anyone an inkling of what you desire. The truth is that when you talk about what you're going to do, you scatter your forces. You lose the close connection you have with the subconscious. Go and tell no man still holds true. The repetition will be the means of driving the suggestion deeply and firmly into the subconscious mind. It has been my observation that those who consciously use this science, as well as those who may be using it unconsciously, are people of tremendous energies, virtually human dynamos. They are people who not only use their imagination and hold strong beliefs and convictions, but they are great doers in action. And that brings me to this most important statement. Faith without action is dead. Sooner or later, there will come an intensity that will reveal the intensity of your thought. Emerson wrote that every man carries in his eyes the exact indication of his rank. Remember that your own gradation or position in life is marked by what you carry in your eyes. So develop eyes that say confidence. Often I have thought of this matter of desire and suggestion in connection with the planting of vegetable or flower seeds. Once the soil is prepared and the tiny seeds are placed in it, it only takes a short time until they begin to root and sprouts begin to appear. The moment they start upward through the soil in search of light, sunshine and moisture, obstacles mean nothing to them. They will push aside small stones or bits of wood and if they can't do that, they'll extend themselves and grow around them. And so it can be with you and the suggestions you give to your subconscious mind. The results will be pure or complex depending upon the original seed and the attention which you give it. In other words, plant the right kind of seed and habitually feed it with strong affirmative thought always directed toward the same end. It will grow into a mighty force finding ways and means of overcoming all obstacles. We seldom realize how much our emotional vibrations affect others and how much we're affected by theirs. An extremely nervous person in a position of authority can put nearly every person associated with him into a nervous state. It's always important to remember 
that a negative person can raise havoc in an organization or a home. The same amount of damage can be done by a strong negative personality as good can be done by a positive one. When the two are pitted together against one another, the negative frequently becomes the more powerful. To get a better understanding of the effect of these suggestive vibrations, you need only to read your varying feelings when entering different offices or homes. The atmosphere, which is the creation of the people living there, can be instantly detected as being upsetting, disturbing, tranquil, or harmonious. The vibrations set up by others affect us much more than we realize. We take on the characteristics of those with whom we are more or less constantly associated. If you want to remain a positive type, avoid associating too much with anyone who has a negative or pessimistic personality. A person who desires riches must go where the riches are. Alone on a desert island, a man would probably have a tough time eking out a living to say nothing of trying to amass a fortune. The right mental attitude. Being properly attired, keeping your eyes straight ahead and fixed on your goal. Throwing around you the proper aura, which is done by an act of your imagination or an extension of your personal magnetism, will work wonders. When man fully comprehends the great power of his mind and earnestly puts it to work, he will have dominion over this earth and everything on it. You yourself have this inner spark, but it must be fanned until the fire is of white-hot intensity, and it must be constantly stoked, which you do by adding fuel, ideas, ideas, more ideas and action. I have tried to make plain how this power through belief can be developed and to take you up the ladder as far as you wish to go. It is necessary though to point out that it is easy to lose one's belief or faith. Thousands have risen to great heights of success only to stumble, roll, or fall to undreamed of depths. There are many weakening factors and influences, all suggestive in nature, which we, in unguarded moments, allow to slip into our subconscious minds. Once these influences begin their destructive work, they can undo all the good accomplished by our constructive forces. So step out in front, head toward the sun, keep facing it, and the dark shadows will not cross your path. I know that it is difficult for the average person who knows nothing of this subject to accept the idea that all is within. But surely the most materialistic person must realize that as far as he himself is concerned, nothing exists on the outside plane unless he has knowledge of it or unless it becomes fixed in his consciousness. It is the image created in his mind that gives reality to the world outside of him. Happiness, sought by many and found by few, therefore is a matter entirely within ourselves. Our environment and the everyday happenings of life have absolutely no effect on our happiness except as we permit mental images of the outside to enter our consciousness. Happiness is wholly independent of position, wealth or material possessions. It is a state of mind which we ourselves have the power to control. And that control lies with our thinking. Emerson said, what is the hardest task in the world? To think. Obviously this is so when one considers that most of us are victims of mass thinking and feed upon suggestions from others. We all know that the law of cause and effect is inviolable. 
Yet how many of us ever pause to consider its workings? The entire course of a man's life has many times been changed by a single thought, which coming to him in a flash became a mighty power that altered the whole current of human events. History is replete with the stories of strong-minded, resolutely willed individuals who steadfastly holding to their inner convictions have been able to inspire their fellow man and in the face of tremendous and determined opposition have literally created out of nothing great businesses, huge empires and new worlds. They had no monopoly of thought power. You and every man and woman have it. All you have to do is use it. You will then become the person you envisage in your imagination. Know yourself, know your power. Just believe that there is a genuine creative magic in believing and magic there will be. For belief will supply the power which will enable you to succeed in everything you undertake. Back your belief with a resolute will and you will become unconquerable. To become the person that you would like to be, you create a mental picture of your newly conceived self. And if you continue to hold it, the day will come when you are in reality that person. Exceptional people begin with just ambitions. We can choose to believe in ourselves and thus to strive, to risk, to persevere and to achieve. We can choose to set no limits on ourselves, to set high goals and dream big dreams. I'm talking about a desire so fierce that it changes a person's life. We can use those dreams to fuel our spirits with passion. We can fall in love with our own abilities and our own potential then choose to maximize those abilities. We're free to choose what we're going to think about ourselves. No one can stop us from chasing our dreams. You get to write your life story. I would venture that most people are talented in something, whether they realize it or not. It's something internal. Great performers share a way of thinking, a set of attitudes and attributes like optimism, confidence, persistence, and strong will. They all want to push themselves to see how great they can become. These attributes and attitudes cause champions to work harder and smarter than other people. They help them stay focused under pressure and to produce their best performances when the stakes are highest. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it was written that the runner with the best foot speed doesn't always win the race, and the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. That knowledge persisted into the 20th century. Striving to be exceptional is never easy. Going after big ideas takes sweat. It takes persistence, patience, and a bedrock belief in yourself. 
I care about how a person lives his life. I care about whether a person refuses to place limits on himself and instead chases greatness. I had a privileged upbringing. I mean that my childhood taught me to be optimistic. I didn't know it then, but I realize now that this was a precious gift. Exceptional people, I have found, either start out being optimistic or learn to be optimistic because they realize that they can't get what they want in life without being optimistic. That's why I say I was privileged. I didn't have to learn optimism. It was given to me. I learned to believe that with hard work, you could be the best. That's optimism. It may not be as natural for people growing up today to feel optimistic as it was for me and many others in my generation. Instead of seeing examples of people succeeding and progressing, they can find it all too easy to see examples of people struggling. One of the ways people learn to be optimistic is by seeking out role models who have achieved great things. If these role models are in some way similar to themselves, they can help instill optimism. One classic example is the evolution of the world record for the one mile run. Pessimism abounded about whether a human being was even capable of running a four minute mile. There were articles in the press in which supposed experts opined that the human body simply wasn't built to run a mile that fast. Then a British medical student and elite amateur runner, Roger Bannister, took a look at the prevailing pessimism and decided it was poppycock. Bannister decided he was capable of running a four minute mile and he trained hard to do so. On a rainy day in 1954, he did it, running a 359.4 mile. Almost immediately, an Australian runner, John Landy, bettered Bannister's record. Within a few years, many runners broke through the once impregnable four minute barrier. Bannister had been a powerful role model and his success turned many runners from pessimists to optimists about their ability to break four minutes in the mile run. Optimism is an attitude that people can choose to have. Obviously, I was fortunate and that my upbringing made it easier to be optimistic, but if it hadn't, I could have chosen optimism. It's not easy, but it can be done. Optimism is often an act of faith, a belief in something that cannot be proven. Anyone can have it. Find ways to become and stay optimistic. I like anyone who's performing to have an optimistic attitude because performances go best when the performer trusts her skills and lets the performance flow. One way both teams and individuals can help themselves to an optimistic frame of mind is visualization. Visualization is a kind of purposeful, intense imagination. Optimism doesn't guarantee anything in sports. It just improves your chances. So why wouldn't you be optimistic if it were a choice you could make? And it is a choice. I've had many clients who tell me that while they believe some people are by nature optimistic, they are by nature the glass half empty kind. My reply to that is, okay, are you only going to tackle the challenges that are easy for you? If not, then the first thing you have to do is decide that being optimistic is important to you because you understand that optimism is essential in fulfilling your dreams and attaining your goals. Once you make that decision, you have to start looking at things from a different perspective. Are you going to focus on all the gloom and doom stories in the media? Will you own your mind or let others own it? Will you see yourself succeeding 
where others don't? Are you going to generalize in a negative way from every setback you encounter? Misfortune happens to everyone. Champions just refuse to let it push them into doubtful, fearful thinking. It would indeed be illogical to persist if you thought you didn't have a chance to succeed. That's the way champions think after the setbacks and losses they inevitably suffer. I understand that everyone, including champions, has occasional doubts. No one should be upset if doubt occasionally enters his mind. Individuals who achieve durable, frequent success are optimists. They shake off their doubts and know in their heads and in their hearts that in the long run, they are going to be successful. They're going to have great careers. Everything will fall into place and wonderful things will happen to them if they keep doing the right stuff. A confident self-image. People tend to become what they think about themselves. There is enormous wisdom in that sentence and there's enormous hope. We are each the biggest influence on our own destiny. We each have the power to construct our own self-image and that the self-image we construct will very likely determine what we become in life. Confidence and optimism are closely related. The good portion of the trait we call confidence resides in the subconscious part of the brain. Our subconscious is very susceptible to suggestion. Your subconscious monitors all the thoughts you have about yourself and it does so uncritically. You can think of your self-image as an archive of all the thoughts you've ever had about yourself. Recent thoughts are way more influential than thoughts that occurred further in the past. Thoughts associated with powerful emotions are more memorable and thus more influential than thoughts to which you attach no emotions. You understand that you are not a helpless victim of misfortune. You don't have to be a prisoner of a bad experience. You make sure you continually feed useful, positive thoughts to the subconscious. That's a champion's mind. A champion understands that it's fine to savor an experience when it's positive, to remember it, to celebrate it. When an experience is negative, he understands that he can't let himself get stuck in it. He can see no benefit from ingraining a bad experience by reliving it or attaching strong emotions to it. This ability is counterintuitive for a lot of people. We're taught in school to revisit and think about our mistakes. Our correct answers are passed over and taken for granted. The teacher puts a big red X next to mistakes. Some people tell me that making this change in the way they think is hard work. I agree. But so is training the body. If an individual wants to be exceptional, it's part of the challenge also. Thinking correctly will separate that individual from the average person. Even if we try to maintain control with our conscious brains, at the moment of truth, your subconscious had better be saying, oh yeah, I got this, no problem.
Champions understand that they must be confident to a point that some people might find offensive. To be clear, when I speak of confidence, I exclude both arrogance and laziness. To me, confidence doesn't mean that an individual or team fails to prepare. All of that preparation and dedication is, to my mind, intertwined with confidence.